Hey guys, and welcome to another episode of the Q&A. Lots of lore discussion. What can I say? We talked about a lot of lore last week. You guys had a lot of questions about lore, and I'm in the mood. I'm in the zone. So, plenty of things to talk about. Now, first, though, to touch on a couple of topics from last week's episode. Number one, the whole movement speed thing. I can't believe there was such a response to this, but uh, we did very briefly talk about the idea of whether movement speed penalties in combat are beneficial to Guild Wars 2 just as a game, like for its combat, for everything. Because obviously, especially in PvE, people can get very annoyed by the fact that you suddenly move slower when an enemy hits you. I talked a bit about the pros and cons. A lot of people did then come to me and say, no, they think of it this way instead. And because so many people said that, I thought I may as well mention it to everyone on mass now. The idea may not be that it's a movement speed penalty in combat. If your perspective, rather, is that the core game, the base game, the everything about the game really is about the combat, then instead you can look at it as... That's just movement speed, how it is in combat, and you actually have an out-of-combat buff. Now, that's crazy to me. I never would have considered having that perspective. I guess I value exploration and general walking around as more the core elements of the game rather than the combat, but it's funny to see how people's perspective there can totally shift what you see the system as. Regardless, however we define it in our own minds, I do think that I stand by what I said uh, last episode, which is that I think it's a positive thing, and I actually don't mind it at all. So, let's jump straight in. The first question is from Paul Mega, who says, Okay, that DPS meter, what is it, and whom to sell a soul for that? Uh, so, again, this is a bit of a reference to the last episode where on the footage I was raiding and I was actually showing off Jax NX. This is the only, as far as I'm aware right now, super legal DPS meter. People care a lot more about them ever since raids came out. And they're really, really interesting tools. Very, very cool. And actually, because this one's legal in the way that it works, I wanted to make a video on it for you guys. I uh, recorded that run that you saw in the previous Q&A, which I'll talk more about. But uh, I also recorded a run this week as well on my Condi Necro. And you guys wouldn't be seeing a Q&A today, actually, if that footage of the Necro hadn't broken. So... While I wanted a Jax NX up today, it all died, and it was very, very sad for me to find that out, basically because of some new hardware that I've bought recently, and uh, I kind of have to reshoot all that stuff. So that would have been the video. It's called Jax NX, and I'll be talking to you guys about uh, the whole topic in good detail on, on an upcoming video. All right, so moving on entirely from last week's stuff. First one comes from Jared Strife, who says, Question. Do you think ArenaNet will ever add in a world boss to the Char Starter Zone Plains of Ashford? Because if you think about it, the other four starting areas all have a world boss. For example, Metrica Province has the Fire Elemental, the Caledon Forest has the Jungle Worm, Queensdale has the Shadow Bemoth, and finally, Wayfarer Foothills has the Moor. That makes Plains of Ashford the only beginner zone that doesn't have a world boss. Do you think that the Plains of Ashford deserves one, or is that just wishful thinking? I personally do want to see Plains of Ashford get a world boss, but not necessarily for parity across all the maps. Not because I think that everyone deserves it in equal measures, right? Actually, I mean, really, already those starter zones aren't totally even with one another. For example, the uh, Silvari and the Asura both having to share a mid-level map, right? But I do think that the Plains of Ashford deserves one. Those of you guys who watch a lot of my streams, you'll know that I ramble on about this idea that I really think ArenaNet should go for. I think they should dedicate a team uh, specifically to revamping old content. And that's a crazy thing to say. I think a lot of people in the community really wouldn't like the idea. But I care a lot about the story. I really think the personal story is balked. And I think they can do amazing things. And the main thing that I think about when I talk that, about that idea that is the Char story and the early Char maps. Plains of Ashford in general and the Char early story... All seem very, very, very rushed. The Char story revolves around building up a warband and taking, meeting lots of different people, making different decisions so that eventually you've got your group, you've rebuilt your family, and then you take them out on some big mission uh, to, against the Flame Legion in the end as they threaten the Black Citadel. It's a really good idea, but it's done so short, it's so botched that it really doesn't go as far as a story like that deserves to go. Uh, and then when you look at the maps themselves as well, they're kind of interesting. Diestra is actually one of my favorite maps just because that had interesting things. But over the years, it's lost a lot of its flavor. There's no more betting. There's no more... I think actually people have told me you can still bet with the Harpies. You can't bet on the cow races anymore, for example. And Plains of Ashford, above all especially compared to the other start maps, has just so little going on. I think the amount of events on Plains of Ashford is 
like a third of the amount that you see in other maps, or at least the ones that are actively rolling that are on reasonable cooldowns. There's a lot of that map that could use big overhauls, revamps, and especially I like to look at the meta event there, right? Like, that meta's cool. This world boss style thing doesn't necessarily have to be us fighting against a giant static uh, mob. Actually, the correct classification of these enemies, by the way, guys, is epic mobs. It comes above legendary. That's what, like, the fire elemental is, for example. But you could actually have a good war style siege against a bunch of... Ascalonian Ghost. It is, of course, a star map. This doesn't have to be, any, be anything ridiculously difficult. But I do remember very fondly back to launch some of these when there was massive amounts of population in a place like Plains of Ashford and completing that entire meta event where you push into the ruins of Ascalon City, you cross those bridges, you fight against the ghosts, and you eventually you know, battle for victory against some old faces as well back from the previous game. That's got the strings and the underlying mechanics there to become a world boss. It just needs a ch an opportunity for the devs to look at it, sit down and revamp all that stuff and that's exactly what I would be so eager on having arena net do right like they would release a big char themed revamp which revamps Diesa Plateau Plains of Ashford maybe uh, up, upwards of Fields of Ruin 2, adds a bunch of new stuff in the Black Citadel, transforms the Bane into a proper, like, PvE, PvP section, similar to what we have in the Guilds, revamps the personal story, adds a bunch of new uh, gem store, char customization options, adds a bunch of new char armor, char weapons, and then what you get is this awesome moment where the entire community rallies around this cool new char revamp, and everybody's rolling new chars, and they're experiencing the new char story, and they're going to Plains of Ashford, they're going to Diesa Plateau, and they're experiencing that world boss now, there now, and they're experiencing a heap of new events that have been dropped on, then once you've experienced with the char, you have, you know, the human-centric update, then one for each race, and then eventually, you know, the later areas of the personal story. I would love that! That'd be so cool! And, uh, yes, that would be an opportunity to add a world boss there. Given that that's not a plan, given that that's not a plan I think too many people would be very excited to hear about right now, though I think it would be really good for the game, I don't know whether we'll ever actually see a world boss there, but maybe the wishful thinking will get us somewhere at some point. Next question is from Zuturura. <laughs> I've definitely not said your name correctly. Who says, why were the underwater golems added but removed not long ago? Were they thinking of adding another underwater map, like a raid in the Capricorn, but threw away the idea? I'm curious, and I want an underwater PvP map. Maybe even a fourth trait line for underwater combat, wouldn't that be awesome? Alright, so the last thing, we've talked about this on, on this channel before. Yeah, that'd be really cool! That'd be really cool! There's a lot of cool things that they could do with the new specialization system, but the reason that the underwater golems appeared in Heart of the Mist is actually a very simple one. It's nothing active that the devs are doing at all. It's because it was Winter's Day. The amount of people that ask me about this is crazy to me. What you guys have to understand is they have a Winter's Day Heart of the Mists map saved that was created back during the first year of Guild Wars 2. So when they added all of the Winter's Day decorations to it, it was on, you know, that original map. Then, you know, as the years have gone by, Heart of the Mist has changed slightly, NPC positions have changed slightly, and for example, when they removed Raid on the Capricorn and reduced the underwater content that existed in PvP, they of course changed Heart of the Mist 2 and got rid of that little lagoon pace. And that's all well and fine, but then when the next Winter's Day came round, instead of rebuilding an entire new Winter's Day and once again blocking it off and once again doing all of that, they just said, alright, let's just put our current uh, Heart of the Mist Winter's Day map in, and of course that's still based on the original old versions, which is why the underwater golem suddenly popped back up then once winter's day left again and we went back to the normal heart of the mist guess what they disappeared again so it's just a byproduct of the way that arena net dropped the winter's day map in it has nothing to do with anything they actually have planned even though there was a screenshot of raid of the capricorn on some of their recent pvp news i guess that was just a cool quick screenshot and it didn't actually mean anything in the end so yeah that, that's basically what's going on there next question is from ts bulmer one who says, in prophecies, and so now we're getting to the law. He says, in prophecies, last episode we were talking about the gift of true sight. He says, did the gift of true sight reveal anything besides the Massart? Other NPCs, hidden passages, treasure. Well, there was a mechanic in the game to reveal hidden treasure and hidden passages. It was one of the more marketed features of Eye of the North, and in the end was... Thoroughly disappointing in my opinion. That was the light of Delgimor. That was a mechanic where while you were in dungeons, if you used a specific PvE only skill that had combat applications, but it would also interact with the environment somewhat. Uh, the devs actually, it can be easy to forget this, but they had kind of a, a concept in early Eye of the North development that, and early Guild Wars 2 development as well, some of the earliest things we heard about it, was that skills would 
have lots of different uses, but it would all be based on context. So a skill may, yes, indeed have something to do in combat, but it also may have something to do in exploration too. Something that eventually got wormed away in a big way. But uh, this we saw in the light of Delgin War. But aside from that, no, there wasn't really any such mechanic and certainly not tied to Ascension. Ascension... And the gift of true sight in particular are kind of really difficult to understand because it's like you became ascended and then gift of true sight just sort of came at the same time and was a perk of being ascended. But being having the gift of true sight doesn't necessarily mean you were ascended. Here's something interesting about the whole topic, though, that I never mentioned in the previous episode that I do think is kind of cool. Another perk of becoming ascended was it would allow you mechanically and in the lore, I suppose, access to the mists. If you were ascended, then you could travel through the mists. If you weren't ascended, I kind of got the impression from the lore, and maybe this is just more personal taste from me because we really don't have too much to interpret from this, but I kind of got the impression that was that if you tried to explore the mists when you were not ascended or closer to the gods, it would kind of be dangerous for you. So, like, the first guy we heard about opening these portals on Tyria to go to the mist, Lord Odrin, he was, uh, the, the undead and the people in those other realms were not happy for his trespasses. And eventually he was just torn to shreds on, like, one of his visits into the mist, and that was it. It was over for him. And I get the impression that the reason it was dangerous for him and the reason your average person can't, you know, willy-nilly go to the underworld to speak with their dead mother like we saw Gwen doing in the previous game was because people weren't ascended. That ascension is what buys you the comfort of traveling through other realms and so it's kind of interesting to me that becoming ascended allows you to travel through the other realms and at the same time gave you gift the gift of true sight which let you see other creatures that were slipping out of phase of reality and kind of going to the mist themselves like the Massards. And it's also funny that whether it was just fabricated by Glint or what, the whole story of the Massart being that their race would eventually be destroyed by creatures from the mists from another realm, the Titans, when their entire race is built on slipping out of phase and going into the mists and trespassing there, perhaps. So maybe maybe there's some some extra tie there, but all of it's very, very weird. It all seems very closely tied to the mist. Food for thought for you guys. If you can come up with a coherent theory out of all of that, I'd be very uh, curious to hear it. It's kind of cool. The general idea that would be on the tip of my tongue then is that the Massart slipped out of phase with Tyria, left our reality, uh, would hide in other realms to become invisible to Tyrians or whatever, and they were attracting danger to themselves somehow by doing this. That somehow ties into the Titans being manufactured in the foundry of cr failed creations by Abaddon, and then the Titans were hellbent on taking them out. I don't know. Or Glint just saw the future, and, you know, it really was just a self-fulfilling prophecy, and there's very little else to it. This question is from Vita Eagle, quite a quick clear one here, but he says, Hey WP, I've been watching your Eye of the North Let's Play, and there was one major thing after it was over that left me wondering. Did the Scepter of Ore somehow get in the hands of Palawa Joko? Completely different topic, as you guys can see. And that's how he was able to take over Alona. That would explain why the hero we played as in Guild Wars 1 was actually killed. Well, I don't think they really need an explanation for why our hero was killed. Our, our hero would have been killed, would have been ended owing to the passage of time and the fact that we, we, we never became immortals. We never became these ridiculous... And the funny thing is, you might think, oh, there aren't many immortals in Guild Wars. But there are a lot of examples of very long-lived characters. You know, there are Jotun that theoretically could have been alive uh, today in Guild Wars 2 that were still alive back in GW1, in the, if I'm not mistaken, or Ogres. And, um, you know, back in Kryta in GW1 as well, there were these Magi characters. So specifically, one of my favorite characters from all of Guild Wars 1 is a guy called Magi, uh, Magi Malaguire. And he just was a random NPC, basically, that you'd speak to. He gave you a quest to teach you about Signet of Capturing, which was an old system for acquiring new skills in that game. And he just had all these weird lines that suggested he was immortal somehow. And those lines continued to persist even up until Guild Wars 1's Living World, uh, the War in Kryta stuff where he reappeared. He was still suggesting that he was he was more than just a mere mortal, and he had been on the planet for years and years and years, even though he just appeared to be like one of your generic kind of tribal-looking Crichton dudes. So it would have been possible, I guess, or more possible than you might expect for our character to still be alive somehow, and they only were ended by some tragic, specific meeting with Palawa Joko. But I, I don't think that the story is that complicated. I think it's more just that 
we retired from being a hero at some point. We settled down, we died to old age, and the last, uh, you know, moments, the last chapters of our story really weren't that interesting and not too much happened. I mean, hell, it's hard enough to find evidence of us in uh, Guild Wars 2 as it is when we really were doing the heroic things and other characters seem to have taken credit for it, which I understand, than it is, uh, you know, for our later years. But uh, the idea of Palawa Joko getting the Scepter of Orc, I guess that's the crux of the, the question, and it's not something that I think I really like the idea of. First of all, yes, it's possible. I, I will always maintain that it's possible, but there really is no indication that it actually happened. There's no indication that Livia ever interacted with Palara and somehow there was an exchange there. Why would Palara have ended up getting it from Livia? The only thing is the devs were ever really clear to us about was that Livia did not have the scepter for long before it moved on. That was bit, but that's pretty much it. Uh, those completely in the dark. The Scepter of War is a, uh, was a long-standing relic and cliffhanger from the previous game that we thought would be resolved in Guild Wars 2, and to this day, it still hasn't been. Uh, no, I prefer the story that Palawa Joko didn't conquer Elona with the Scepter of War, or owing it to some powerful relic or artifact. I mean, there was no tell of him doing that on his original conquering of Elona long before even GW1. I just like to think that he did it because he's a badass villain. He's a cool character. He does it off of his own merits, right? He he conquers Elona through patience, through manipulation, and through wit, right? He is just cool, and he takes his time, and he strikes when people least expect it. He slowly accrues his army of undead from the desolation once again, and he bites his, bides his time until the, that his time is right. And uh, and then, of course, he dams the river, and, so, and the rest is history. That's what I think would be cool about Joko, not that he did it just because he has the Scepter of War. But who knows? The Staff of the Mists, for what it's worth, was located in the desolation, and we knew that Palawa and many of his undead cronies were operating out of there once before, too. So maybe he's not totally alien to that idea. The uh, next question is from Sven Morki, who says, uh, on the topic of magic, what's the most powerful spell available to the people of Guild Wars 2 at the moment? Is there a difference between the races? And do you think there's a way to ascend slash become a god in the current lore, considering there are no cults that seek higher goals than sustaining themselves? It's an interesting idea. I, I certainly think that Gehera and ba Balefire, as we mentioned in the previous episode, and uh, the Flame Legion sort of still have that goal. But um, the most powerful spell, I mean, do you mean in terms of mechanics, like what we can cast? That's pretty interesting. Maybe the, the Revenant's mini Jade Winds would be somewhere up there. But I mean, you look at like even like Elementalist, a Meteor Shower is something pretty crazy to be able to do too. To actually look at the lore, we have seen some ridiculous stuff. We've seen like the Faux Fire was ridiculous. The Cataclysm in all was pretty ridiculous. The Searing even, uh, conjured as it was by the chart, is also kind of ridiculous. And another Searing that we saw was uh, used against the forces of Zaitan um, a couple of years back at the actual main story. That's all pretty powerful, ridiculous stuff. Of course, I do think uh, we could be in a very different place. ArenaNet could have taken their expansion story in a very different place by focusing on this stuff, right? Like, now Zaitan's dead. Think about it. The Faux Fire and the Cataclysm, both uh, related to Relics of Ore, both related most likely to the magic that was seeping out of Zaitan that was, uh, you know, being tapped into in major ways, foolish ways, by people like the humans and, and you know, with disastrous results. And now Zaitan's dead and all that magic's been mixing out everywhere. It should be like, you know, artifacts like the uh, the cauldrons or the lost scroll that the vizier read from. Stuff like that. There should be crazy amounts of magic around that could be getting fused with everywhere. They totally could have written the, that, the story that way. And the expansion storylines, could we could have done a lot more from the fallout, that magic that's been released from Zaitan's dead body. And now more Jamoths too, but they just kind of didn't go down that angle. As I say, I do think that one of the best places that Guild Wars 2's story could go in general is people wielding such power. Power, um, and actually how the characters themselves handle dealing with that power but uh, they haven't done it so far we, we'll, we'll see though maybe maybe the living world and future expansions will start to tie into that kind of stuff a little bit more but I do think to the original question what the most powerful spell is available to people if you consider the cauldrons still available to us which they kind of are definitely the thought that we could just summon even more random searings on people as the priory demonstrator they can that's probably one of the most powerful things we've got. Next question is from Icelandic17176, who says, No magic to be had on the Fire Island chain. Wooden potatoes? There's the Door of Kamali and the Bloodstone. They seem like pretty magic-heavy items. 
interesting, yeah, but I will challenge you on this. So in the last episode, I mentioned that why would the Masat be there? Oh, sorry, I mentioned why would Primordus care about the Fire Island chain because there's nothing particularly magical going on. You're right, there are things of note on the Fire Island chain, but that's all I think that those two examples you give are. They're things of note. I would say, you know, if Sahothin still remained on Rurik's dead body there, that then, yeah, we've got something magical we can talk about that Primordus might want. But of course, Ritlock mysteriously got that at some point, so... That's off the table. Let's actually talk about these two things. First of all, the bloodstone. You're right, the bloodstone could could have magic in it. But also, as far as I remember, the bloodstone that was there on the Fire Island chain was specifically re referred to as the keystone. The keystone being this fabled chunk of the stone that rather than containing magic necessarily, it is instead used to reunite the other four chunks of the bloodstone to rebuild it in its entirety. The idea of that story of there being a keystone, being able to reunite all that stuff, the devs haven't talked about for a long time. It could just be a dropped story thread altogether. But uh, that could mean in theory that piece of the bloodstone doesn't function like the others um it does in some ways and the, we, the, the massacre clearly could sacrifice people over it and set up their soul batteries around it and so on but maybe it doesn't actually contain much magic itself and as for the door well the door i never really thought of as something containing much power it was something that used a lot of power it used souls uh, you know to charge it and then the batteries would run dry until eventually the the door would give way again right so it's not necessarily a thing that would be full of magic either uh, not necessarily on the scale that elder dragons would care about yes it's manufactured by the massar who are great power uh, spell casters and probably infused a lot of power into them but after 250 years of being melted into lava, as everything else would have been in theory, and being inactive, not having souls fused into them, would they really have much magic, much juice left? I actually think the one thing that really makes it very notable for an Elder Dragon as a location is this is actually a place, Ontario, one of the rare places where there is a connection to the mists, uh, a connection to the other realms, right? And maybe Primordus would be interested in it for that reason, more than just the relics and things that are littered about there based on, you know, what these races did while he was last asleep. Sort of related to this as well, somebody asked me about the Titans as well, whether the Titans are all dead, because of course this this entrance to another realm is where the Titans were all coming from. Uh, that's a great question as well. I wouldn't be surprised if they left the odd Titan around, you know, just so that it's possible for them to talk about in, in the story. But I wouldn't say that there's necessarily any new ones coming out, because yes, the Titans were being created in the Foundry of Foud Creations by minions of Abaddon. And the way you get a Titan, it's described that you take a tormented soul, a tortured soul and you twist it somehow and that's how you manufacture a titan and now that Cormir kind of is in that realm I can't imagine that she'd still be manufacturing more titans though there's of course the possibility that titans are being made somewhere completely else right like maybe titans don't have to come just from the foundry maybe there's another as of yet completely unheard of place in the story that titans can come from and the reason why i'm entertaining the idea that the titans could still potentially be a part of the story is i actually think you could do some really cool things with titans i don't know whether you guys have noticed but some of the guild wars 2 concept art like, for example, think of the original Kessex Hills concept art. Depict some really beautiful giant creatures. And I would like to see Titans come back to Guild Wars 2 at some point and kind of get the Oak Heart treatment. What do I mean by the Oak Heart treatment? Well, in Guild Wars 1, Oak Hearts looked really stupid. They were kind of small, almost crab-like looking plant things. Unique design, I'll give them that, but nothing too great. And in Guild Wars 2, Oak Hearts are these big, majestic, cool creatures. One of those things that usually makes a, a new player's jaw drop when they first come across them. And they're big right they're really cool now the thing about the titans in guild wars 1 was they looked kind of naff now looking back but they were by far away the biggest creatures you fought when they were originally added to the game back at prophecy's original la launch these things were huge so a part of them the titans is to be really big right so bring them back in guild wars 2 give them the oak heart treatment though let's get some shadow of the colossus style massive scary beautiful like uh, monsters around and have, you know, the, the Titans 2.0. I would love to see that. Don't forget that in the lore of the Titans as well, this wouldn't even necessarily break it to give them a redesign. One core feature of a Titan is that it adapts to its environment, its surroundings. Titans that we encountered in the jungle looked different to Titans we encountered on the Shiver Peaks, looked different to Titans we encountered on the Fire Island chain. They're an adaptable species in terms of their appearance. And so they totally can get a really cool redesign that makes them much more big and, big and intimidating. I, I, I'd really like that. All right, uh, a couple of quick questions just to end off because I've rambled for a little bit too long. Devin Belva said, Hey WP, I've always been curious about why condition damage in this game uh, 
degenerates and ticks. Whenever I go back to Guild Wars 1, I've always liked how they don't actually tick, it just has steady degeneration. Mechanically speaking, if you have 17 burning on you in Guild Wars 2, and in one tick you're instantly at 50% health, cleansing it off right before the, the next tick means the time in between the ticks had no effect on your character. Why do you think the devs decided to change it to this? Do you like one method more than the other? So yeah, to be explicit here, in Guild Wars 1 and other games you guys will have played, if you get something degenerative on you, like bleeding or a hex that causes you to lose health, it's just constantly draining down actively, like point by point of health, it's going down, right? Uh, but in Guild Wars 2, they come down in pulses, right? It will be, I've got 22 bleeding on me, but if I'm quick enough to cleanse it, it doesn't actually do any damage because I did it just before the, the, the pulse. Uh, somebody responded to this in the comments, and I absolutely agree. This would be my first inkling, though I don't actually know. I, I, I had have a feeling that it's got something to do with the servers. Guild Wars 1, they really didn't have that many entities on individual little maps to track that many things. Guild Wars 2, you can have 150 people hitting the same mob. And maybe it's just easier to count the ticks that way. Especially considering how many different things there are or how high they can stack. Especially now that they're capless. But uh, yeah, I don't believe we've ever had a dev directly talk about that. That would be the kind of thing that would be interesting to hear about uh, straight from them, really. And then the final question is from Jani Katajamaki6, who says, How would you like to see the story of Guild Wars to end? Or just Guild Wars in general. Like, how would the last ever expansion for the franchise end? And in what kind of state would Tyria be at that point? Great question. I don't have a true answer to this in that I could go into crazy, crazy, crazy details. I actually don't often invent my own ideas for where the story could go. I'll look at things that are in the game and, you know, invent theories and think about things that the devs could be hinting at and draw connections between disparate areas of the lore to come to conclusions about where they might go. But actually sitting down and, like, having my own plans and my own thoughts about what they should do, I'm usually quite vague. I like general ideas, but I don't proper theory craft that kind of stuff out. But in the end, I think that Guild Wars, it's really the story of Tyria. Now, yes, there's stuff around the other realms, right? We know about them. There's a little bit of content around them. In Guild Wars 1 and 2, some personal story steps are taking you into the mists. Uh, early Norn stuff, for example. But um, when it really comes down to it, I think that we are looking at the story of Tyria. And I think then the end point has to be... Turning a new page in Tyria, right? Like, going into another act. Maybe there's a full new set of races that, you know, for whatever disaster occurs, all of our races die out. We're way forward in the, the timeline as kind of a completely new chapter. Tyria exists in a new state. Or all the stories that can theoretically be told around at least this continental region of Tyria have resolved themselves and they're now going into a huge, long, 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 long period of peace. And then the uh, the franchise would expand from beyond Tyria. Maybe we'd now be looking at stuff on an entirely different planet or realm in the mists, but still governed by the same general laws of the universe and so on. It's very hard to think about, like, the end, though. I mean, this is an MMO. Does, do, have any MMOs ever, unless a sequel has explicitly been mentioned for them, had a proper end? I mean, it's such a crazy, crazy, crazy thing to think about. And maybe you guys have got some of your own cool ideas for that too. But there you go, guys. I have definitely talked for way too long today. Thank you very much for listening to the Q&A. If you've got any questions on any of these topics or any others that you've been mulling over, feel free to leave them down below and I will get to you as soon as possible. If you've left a comment before and I never picked it, you can try again. Don't worry, I'm not going to you know, get angry for spam or something like that if you try more than one video in a row. It may just be that there were a lot of other really good ones and I never managed to get to yours just yet. But cheers, guys. I hope you have a great evening. And I'll see you next time.